very interesting people sitting alongside me who are going to discuss kind of alternative business models that might enable more sustainable practice in the fashion industry and I'm going to introduce them one at a time and give them an opportunity to explain a little bit more about what they work on, how they work um, and why they're here I suppose. So here we have Yaha Bron. Uh, Yaha runs a boutique called Paris 99 in Armadale, Elwood. Um, the reason the boutique is quite interesting, uh, firstly it's by appointment only. He sells really gorgeous high-end couture um, which is actually recycled. So um, a little bit different to boutiques that you may see on the high street but selling thoroughly gorgeous pieces. So I'll let him uh, explain a little bit more about how that came about. Hello. Yes. Um, yes, so I uh, pretty much have been obsessed with fashion since I was about 11 years old. And that's when I started picking up Vogue and sketching and, and whatever and walking around all the uh, high-end boutiques, Column Street and Crown at the time and, you know, getting to know the salespeople and what the labels and who carried what and whatever. And um, having my grandmother in Israel record me copious hours of fashion TV, which was only around, um, which wasn't here at that time, which was quite fun to watch it on VCR. And um, in 1999, I went to Paris for the first time, and then it really kind of cemented the fact that I had to be in fashion in some way. Um, then, uh, you know, I took the, the progress to uh, design my own things and you know, really worked at getting into the course at RMIT, which I did, which was kind of good, and um, uh, you know, found my groove as a designer, but never let go of the interest in the history of fashion and designers and uh, which models are in which campaigns in what year and blah 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 blah. Um, and when I finished, well, actually, I went on exchange to Amsterdam, which was my kind of first real exposure to the European fashion industry from an internal perspective and I knew that I wanted to come back and I organised an internship um, with A.F. van der Voorst in Antwerp uh, after I finished RMIT and that was really, really interesting and, you know, to work for a smaller company that um, kind of worked in, in design in the way that I would have wanted to was really good and I met lots of interesting people including unbeknownst to me the people who would um, basically be my suppliers for this project that I'm doing now. So coming back I wanted to get into fashion uh, curation um, after having worked at the Fashion Museum in Antwerp as well uh, for three months assistant curating uh, the Black Exhibition which was on uh, in 2010. And um, all the time just buying uh, pieces of, of high-end designer clothing for my own personal archive and for you know, the interest sake of seeing um, construction and finish and, and all the rest of that that kind of gets me off as a designer. Um, and I just funnily had a couple of my mother's friends over at our house and they, you know, the, some of the clothes were out and they said, oh, what's this? And I said, oh, you can have a look and whatever. And ended up buying a couple of pieces and I thought, okay, this is interesting. And the women that I get everything from are um, personal, it's their personal wardrobe. So I, it's all been uh, bought, you know, for a reason that they've had a bit of an affinity with the piece and, and they found something in it that spoke to them. And then because actually they have lots and lots of money and lots of clothes and whatever, they've worn it once and they don't really need it again. So it's a kind of temporary fascination. And um, from the, I guess, sustainable uh, perspective, which has just kind of come about, it's what I do is try and, uh, first of all, you know, prolong the life of a product that is uh, superior in its design and in its make and in its fabric and, and whatnot. And, you know, it's been worn once, but it actually could last 30, 40, 50 odd years in, with someone else who really would appreciate it further. And um, I also uh, have termed what I do as the democratization of luxury fashion. So, you know, it's a piece um, of, for example, um, 
I have a Versace gown, it's all encrusted with Swarovski crystals and that was a $12,000 mistake by this person, <laughs> which is quite ridiculous, but you know, good for her. And, um, you know, I want someone to be able to access that piece and wear it and love it and, and you know, for it to have a good home, and that I can offer, you know, for about eighteen hundred dollars, and that's not usually my prices. That's the, the kind of root of the prices. Um, but it's be that example that you can have a piece that uh, beautiful and and you know throw some names out there: Longfellow, Long, Long, Balenciaga, Saint Laurent, whatever, um, and it allows people who have who share that kind of obsession with fashion like me, the chance to actually access those pieces and, and wear them. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but you know, you can go to witchery and there's a trench coat for three hundred and sixty or whatever or dollars. And you know, if you can if I'm lucky enough to be able to get a trench coat, which I have now, by Yves Saint Laurent of Silk, Alba Elbaz, you know, historical, um, amazing um, uh, value for four hundred and eighty dollars. So it kind of sets that notion if you look for it, then you can access that, that level of clothing. Then it's to do with the service. So it is, as Lara mentioned, by appointment only, and um, the whole experience is, is that I offer is, um, it's actually more for me, because I'm really interested in, the, in re-establishing the connection uh, between um, you know, myself and the clothing and the clothing and the potential buyer. And that connection has to take time, and it has to be really um, personalised. So you know, there's uh, you know, we set aside two or three hours for an appointment, and it really generally runs over. And it's lots of fun, and we have coffee and cake and tea, and you know, it's quite um, I guess uh, different in in the way that that you know a lot you probably couldn't do that for every kind of retail experience. But that's in the way that I've been able to run the salon. I, you know, this is what happens, and it's good because you know I can have four glasses of wine on the balcony in a day if it's a lovely day, and, and you know pieces of and cake and and Elwood is I don't know if, if, if everyone's familiar with the the roundabout in Elwood, which is the Turtle Cafe, and there's a few other cafes and, and whatnot. It's a beautiful place. The view is gorgeous, and the everyone is really excited by their visit, which is what I want, obviously. And you know there's no obligation to buy, and I make that very clear. If you don't find something the first time, you'll find it the second or the third, and you know don't give up. And, and you know I'd rather that you walk out with nothing that, and then you come back and you're happy, really happy with the thing you get the second time. And everything's word of mouth, so I haven't um, taken steps in advertising and whatnot, and that maintains the connection. So a woman finds me, and then she tells a friend, and there's always that kind of small group of uh, intimate, uh, you know, happenings going on. So I might pass over because I don't know how long I've been rattling on for. <laughs> but um, if there's any questions later, feel free. You raised a lot of things that we'll probably end up touching back on, but we'll move on to Kate for now. Uh, Kate has recently had a baby. Uh, <laughs> for a start, let's start with that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, one of the first people I know, I suppose. Um, Kate worked in the fashion industry in several avenues, most recently completed a PhD on sustainability and the way young people are adopting sustainable behaviours. And that's reflected quite a lot in the work that she does with her business, The Clothing Exchange. So many of you will be familiar with it, but I'll let her introduce it and give it a little bit more of an outline. Um, I guess many years ago, um, I was sitting in my office sort of scratching my head thinking, I love clothes, I love shopping, I love beautiful things, I'm very passionate about this, but oh my gosh, am I worried about the impact on the planet and my, my ecological conscience is firing here. And what do I do? You know, this is a bit of a quandary. And after some head scratching, I decided that I would um, start looking into secondhand clothes and really seek to explore all the options in um, readdressing our, I guess, problem of wasteful consumption, um, focusing primarily on secondhand clothes um, because really um, you don't really necessarily have to recycle them or require any energy or any kind of process, they're just there waiting to be used. Um, delving a little bit deeper, I discovered that we're spending about $1.7 billion on clothes that we're not actually wearing, a tidy sum. Um, 
and it's sort of all of us doing it. It's not really one person who's got a massive wardrobe. It's quite a, a common problem that we buy a lot of things, we get excited by a sale, we have a moment of, of love and then we're, we're disappointed or we've replaced the garment and it's sentenced to the darkest corner of the closet. So uh, hypothesising that there were a lot of overflowing wardrobes out there, I developed a uh, designed a service called the Clothing Exchange, which is essentially uh, the context of an event. You, are, you bring your garments, you bring up to six clothes you value but no longer wear to swap for those that you will, and we use buttons as our accounting system. A lot of people find buttons a lot more appealing than cold hard cash or worse, credit cards. So it's a great way for people to come and sort of revitalise their wardrobes. But it also, I guess, taps into something else I'm very passionate about doing, and um, that is bringing people together to think about sustainable living. And actually, instead of us thinking, well, what do we do after we've recycled our papers and our plastics and separated all that out, um, I actually think that sustainable living should be about, you know, embracing the sociable event and having a lot of fun and being a bit ridiculous and having a good laugh and actually living better by being resourceful rather than compromising. Um, so, I guess the event had an interesting history. Um, we were adopted by the um, L'Oreal Fashion Festival quite early on, and so we'd have these massive swaps at the Melbourne Museum with 170 women and two men, two brave men at the first one, um, eagerly swapping their clothes. So after a couple of years of these large-scale events, um, the demand for a, a, um, a more regular event seemed, seemed present. So we started in a little bar, you know, just anywhere from 1,000 people or 12 people trying to email me to get into a, an event in, in a given week, depending on the publicity. Um, and yeah, we started small scale with cocktails in hand, women swapping, very curious about this idea at the, at the beginning. And then before too long, of course, there were, there were many copycat ventures, there was interest in expanding into different states, and um, we accidentally created quite the swapping movement, um, which is, a, of course, a delight. You, you start something that's a single event and seeing it gain a lot of momentum and even be declared a fashion or a trend in its own right was quite an unexpected bonus. So um, I guess I, I've gone on to look at into pursuing sustainable lifestyles um, in, in my PhD and further studies. I'm still very interested in that. And I'm really excited to see that things like today's event and things like the collaborative consumption movement and all these kind of grouping, um, this momentum to network and share these ideas and actually amplify the interest in them, it's really, really exciting to be a part of because back in 2004, if you said sustainable and fashion in the same sentence, people just said, well, that's an oxymoron. So it's really nice that today has, uh, has come together. Thank you, Lara. And I think I'll wind up there for now. <laughs> so that's really interesting that uh, Kate has raised the point that uh, I'm often faced with. People say, sustainable fashion, what's that all about? Glenn's been, Glenn down the end there, has been playing in this space for a little while through uh, a few different ventures. He works quite closely with designers like Alex Trimmer, who we've just seen in our previous session. Uh, he's taught at RMIT and mentored uh, many an RMIT student, as has Karen, who spoke earlier as well. Um, and he's also working on these gorgeous garments we see beside us from his third time collection, which is uh, ticking along alongside his, his other initiatives. Uh, he might expand a little bit on that. Thanks. I wrote a brief about three years ago, um, and it was, it was born from my frustration of actually being in an industry that was a very quick cycle where your inspiration sort of got down to what I thought was clip notes rather than actually really being able to evolve and think <coughs> through what you like in design as a person. And then of course life got in the way and I didn't do it. And so what I decided to do, I at, at the time I started this collection, um, and when I say collection it's pieces, I don't actually design collections. Um, I work for a lot of companies here in Melbourne as a freelance design consultant and pattern maker. And in doing that, of course, I'm very aware of the uh, consumption and the wastage that, that happens in those industries for, for, the, for the people that I work with. And I myself had run a label for many years, and um, it, it was a successful label. Um, it, it, was part, it did win the New Designer of the Year Award from Melbourne Fashion Festival. It was a great time. The label took off quite well, but I decided that it was moving in a direction that I necessarily didn't want to be moving into. So it was kind of one of those things, careful what you ask for, because you might get it. 
and so I took a break and, and merged myself into freelance, but I did miss the beauty of cutting. One of my loves is, is pattern making, even though I, I consider myself a designer first, but I love to pattern make, I love to cut. I was fortunate enough when I was a young'un to work with Chanel in Paris um, with the Pret-a-Porter people who made jackets and I got taught a lot and like our whole went through RMIT but a little bit uh, a little while ago compared to you and so I in my spare time I started cutting jackets but what I wanted to do is I didn't want to actually create things from newness I didn't want to actually just put something back into the cycle that needed to be created from buying new things, from doing new things. As a designer who works with a lot of designers and as a designer that have my own label, I had quite a lot of fabric under my table. So I decided that I would start using it. So I created a set of patterns um, that were, one of them being this, the other one being a casual jacket, there's a few other styles I didn't bring in, where I would use the same pattern over and over again, but I would cut different fabric every time. And this collection was based on tailoring and sportswear because I've used a lot of knit in pack in sorry in pockets and I I this collection sorry this is meant to turn not me um, where I started sort of going to op shops and buying jumpers and sewing them into the back of garment things like that so there's not one piece of fabric here that actually was bought new um, the fabrics are from under the tables of designers the fabrics are under the table that I had. The, the garments, uh, the knits are bought and cut up from slavers, as I like to call it, not say um, And I created a series. All the linings are used for, from leftover um, silk dresses. I work for companies that make a lot of evening wear. Um, so nothing was actually new. And my whole aim was to find the beauty from, from the discarded. So there was a lot of crap and how do we put it together. So it was also indulgent for me. It was about me wanting to return to cutting, to wanting to return to something that I love. And coincidentally, it works hand in hand with the sustainability of things. Um, my practice is for this um, is, is quite considered. We take three and a half hours to cut and prepare a jacket. We take seven hours to make a jacket. Nothing goes through a factory. And, um, and we pay very, very above award, award wages. So. Um, it's a really, really nice um, idea. We use the, the three main branches of reuse, recycle, recreate. And it's about telling a story. It's about the fact that, that this jumper that's in the back of this garment was worn by somebody else. And it, it's about the fact that, you know, there's a, there's a piece of fabric in this jacket here that is from a 1930s roll of fabric that I discovered when I was a 19-year-old fashion student. And you hang on to it because you just can't throw it away. But what do you do with 40 centimetres of fabric? So it started to go into that. We even made labels, the, the care labels inside, actually thank our machinists and, they, and, and, and we talk about the people that are involved. And there's pretty much no more than about a nine kilometre radius of, um, you might say, cradle to cradle. So it's all about that as well. Putting things back in and, and part of the process of third time is actually to eventually start a fourth time practice where if the garment is in reasonable condition after 12 months it can actually be brought back into the system and it can actually be recut into something else and the advantage because you've got to give someone a bit of a carrot is that they can actually then buy into the new collection with quite a, a good discount so it's about bringing back what we can and then putting it back out there and swapping um, when we were talking about that I've swapped services for garments. I, besides this, I work as a freelance pattern maker and designer and I've actually swapped my services for fabrics that are under people's tables that I know they'll never use, but of course they want money for them. So I've been able to actually use my services for their goods and work that way. And also use that with a lot of other creatives like um, graphic designers and photographers and things like that and work on a way of actually, you know, bartering, swapping, nurturing each other's creativity to actually do that. And none of this is actually going out and buying new fabric, buying this and buying this. It's actually about using what we have as a service and as a, a you know a product that's already existing. So three very different business models as you've just heard. Uh, I suppose for me putting this program together, the reason I thought each of you had a really interesting story to tell is you do use really different principles. 
Um, so Kate mentioned, and I suppose to a certain extent uh, what your hub does as well at Paris 99, it's based on those collaborative consumption principles. It's really interesting that uh, Glenn's mentioned as well that there's that kind of uh, swapping uh, phenomenon behind uh, the future evolution of his business. So that's an interesting um, point as well. I want to perhaps I'll start with Kate to see, um, I saw uh, the clothing exchange, Kate's business partner Juliet participate in an event all about different models around collaborative consumption and uh, we have seen it kind of grow into a bit of a movement as Kate touched on. So I might see if I can get just some thoughts from you on the collaborative consumption movement and how um, that's impacted on your business and the profile of your business as well. Sure. Well, um, what was interesting about the launch of the book Collaborative Consumption that we all participated in, we had a swap there, was um, Rachel Botsman demonstrated by getting us to all awkwardly swap one of our prized possessions with the person next to us in the audience, how painfully awkward and weird it is and how vulnerable you feel, especially if you'd say passed over a prized bag of chocolates or your favourite handbag or something, how vulnerable you feel and how awkward it is to exchange things without some kind of mediating system to make it a whole lot less awkward. Um, so I guess it's an interesting um, thing that I've also noticed about each of our, our organisations here that we uh, address the social aspect of um, getting clothes, getting the utility of the service, getting the, the clothes you want to wear by um, actually really focusing on how to make it socially enjoyable, whether that's um, dosing people up with cake and fine wine or whether it's like creating a swapping party and, and bringing your girlfriends along and creating a, a community of, of friendly people to swap with. Um, I guess a big part of um, what's interesting about these movements is how they address the um, the social aspects and um, when you compare these kind of rich entertaining experiences to going to a department store and being addressed by some frightening, this is just an example by the way, I'm not trying to attack department stores or sales assistants because I've shopped at one and been one so I wouldn't do that but anyway, um, you know you're attacked by someone who tells you you look great in something you look terrible in and you pay too much for it just because you want to get out of there and then you, you know, you throw it on once and realise it's not really for you and then, you know, it's this cold sort of awkward, frustrating and expensive experience. So I think um, it's not just that we're providing the utility of, of garments that you're going to wear and enjoy, but it's how we're presenting them and how we're turning it into a, um, a fun, enjoyable experience you're likely to tell someone about rather than whinge about over your next cup of coffee with your friend. <laughs> and an interesting point to follow on from there, obviously as you have mentioned, uh, quite a lot of his <laughs> business is built on the customer service element um, and I've had many a conversation with people in recent weeks just reflecting on the state of retail in Australia and uh, you know things aren't ideal if there isn't a great uh, retail climate at the moment. So I wonder how, you, how you're finding it obviously a completely different uh, environment than a traditional department store type environment. Um, how, does, how does that impact on the way your business at certain periods according to you know, economic ups and downs? Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. It's, it, is, it does still affect, obviously. I mean, when the market goes down, uh, consumers' behaviour, they get a bit frightened. They, don't, they think, oh, you know, I better save my money for something else. But um, at the same time, um, given the nature of how you know, I do things and the, the, the level of pricing and it's still uh, coming back to the experience, it does, yeah, people still kind of, you know, find find me and, and say, oh, I heard about you or I, I saw your website and I'm interested and, and then it's actually when they arrive they realise what what it actually is. Like it's not, um, as, as Kate mentioned, it's uh, really welcoming and there's this whole element that you don't feel like you're in a shop, and in fact, when I was looking for the, the space itself, um, it was the first space I looked at, and I was the only one who looked at it, which was really good. Um, the pictures on the website were misleading, and they had a picture of the facade and the stairs, and, you know, being number four of six, I thought, okay, there's maybe three or four apartments in this uh, place, 
but I made a meeting with the agent and, and she said, yeah, come have a look, we haven't already done for an inspection yet. And we walked into the front door, which is the foyer, and then you've got the stairs coming up and it's quite dim in the foyer and, and um, cold. But as you walk up, the, the whole apartment is really full of light and it's um, right, you know, 7.30 in the morning, the light's right through the windows and it's really quite pleasant to, to be there. And I thought, yeah, this is exactly what I want. And I asked why are the previous tenants leaving, and she said, which was a real estate agency. And she said, oh, because they say that a lot of people come up and say, oh, it feels like you're going to someone's house rather than a business. And I thought that's exactly what I want. I want that um, comfortable aspect where you're coming to visit a friend and, you know, the clothing is just kind of incidental and it's just there. And if you find something nice, you take and if you don't, you don't. So um, to go back to the question, it does, it does affect, but at the same time, there's, it kind of rides smoothly. It's not to say I'm busy every day, you know, if anyone wants to come along, you can help me. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're, I've really only been in the space for three months, and prior to that I was in, um, you know, my, right, working out of my parents' place, basically. Um, and so it is just a new uh, business anyway, so I'm interested to see how it does grow when people become more familiar with it and, you know, because as far as I understand, um, no one works in the way that I do with the kind of product level that I do. And it is quite difficult, of course, you know, to, to maintain getting the stock and, and whatnot, but I'm, you know, I enjoy it for the moment and we'll see what happens, basically. Um, we touched a little bit on, uh, and also in the previous session as well, about kind of the linear uh, nature of the fashion industry. And obviously all three of you are kind of circumventing that um, repackaging or repurposing or reselling products that have already been in the system. Um, particularly for you, Glenn, um, sourcing some of your stuff from Savers, that's really interesting, um, or whatever else you call it. Slavers. <laughs> Slavers. Um, how, how does that change your sourcing and how does that inform your design practice as well? What, what sort of comes first? It is a, a very different way to design and it was a challenge for me initially because having my own label, you basically were working in more traditional ways of you know, evolving an idea, researching that through availability of fabrics and uh, but then that changed because my my um, starting point was to basically go shopping at op shops and to go shopping at other designers' um, tables and seeing what was there and then actually... So the challenge, the biggest design challenge was to say to yourself, you are not allowed to go out and buy some black wool from a wholesaler because it would go really well with what you're doing. You have to use what's here. And so that really did change. And, and it did happen, um, you know, I'd, I'd cut a series of jackets and I'd get them back from from one of my makers and, and get one back and go, mm, it's pretty crappy, because sometimes you just can't know, so it, it's a sort of jigsaw puzzle, but that's kind of the beauty of it and that reinforces the story and the process of it. It's not just about, you know, I want a black jacket, we're going to make it, and there you go, we've got a black jacket, it's, it's beyond that. But it's about them actually enjoying the experience of what's going on and when you actually talk about the fact that you're involving them and that you're actually giving them more than just a garment, you're giving them a story, you're giving them something that um, has a process, has a really nice evolution and that it's actually come um, from a more sustainable approach, then they actually are loving it even before it's sort of done. So it's actually about appreciating what the consumer is seeing as well. I think that comment you made about, okay, it would be easier, you know, in a lot of ways to just go to a wholesaler and find the missing piece um, is applicable to consumers as well. And I'm really interested to hear from anyone in the audience who may or may not shop by, by things secondhand and how that kind of correlates to the experience that you have in a traditional retail setting where you are just walking in, buying things off the rack, you know there's going to be your size. Um, do you find it difficult? Do you find it easier? Um, is engaging in these sorts of business models that aren't the typical, you know, you know you're going to find something that's going to fit in a witchery or whoever we were talking about before. Um, is there any, any input from anyone in the 
the audience and what that experience, the differences between those two experiences? Um, I'm actually an eco-based stylist, so I work with people's wardrobes, and um, it's really hard when, you know, my, my business model is to work with what's there and really maximise what they've got. I take things away and I do work on a similar principle where I alter them and recreate things that are just a bit dated or the length is too long and blah, blah, blah. But when I go through most people's wardrobes, I discover that they're missing some key pieces. And it's actually really hard to go out there to send my customers, because I do prefer to send customers to eco-based businesses or sustainable businesses. But you know, if they need a red pair of jeans, I mean, I just searched high and low with all the sustainable companies that I know of here in Melbourne and no one's doing red jeans. So, you know, she really needs those in her wardrobe. She's just, you know, she's a mum of four kids. She just runs around. She really wants just things to put on that are going to just look, you know, striking and interesting. And, yeah, it, it, you face those challenges. And, you know, it's not just with the people that I work with, but I, I also, you know, given my background of fashion and the ability to make things for myself and everything, Sometimes I really need those quick fixes of just a staple item which, you know, aren't there. They're not out there. In, in, not in the op shops, but usually like the grey long sleeve jersey that you really need to coordinate with a whole lot of other things to tie things together. You know, you don't want to buy them from the op shop unless you're very lucky. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's slow shopping and, you know, I, I always find second-hand shopping I can never just go in there with expectations at all. You know, you bring in things into your wardrobe that are just amazing and different and they surprise you, but you still need coordinates that, you know, are really difficult to um, yeah, tie things together. Yeah. I suppose to counter that, um, obviously, sorry, did you jump in first, Kate? Go, please do. Yeah, I think um, from my own experiences of being a very enthusiastic op shopper, which is where all this interest sort of started, I guess, um, it's like it's like a treasure hunt. It's not like you can, you know, anticipate. Um, although what I find um, others experience at the clothing exchange and what I used to really enjoy about the um, op shopping experience is you kind of get taken out on a bit of a stylistic limb. Like you'll end up with some crazy Swiss wool wacky pattern jacket and you go, can I wear that? Can I really be brave enough? And then you put it on before too long, it's become your favourite staple because everyone says, wow, where'd you get that from? And because it was made in the 60s or something, it's outlasting everything else that you've bought in the last few years. Um, the problem, though, I find with the basics, um, the good quality basics, is that a lot of things, they say, aren't as made as well as they used to, and a lot of um, garments I find that I, if I'm buying something new, regardless of whether I pay $20 or $200 for it, it can peel, it can split, um, you know, these things don't last. We're no longer shocked when something starts to come apart at the seams. But um, it's good to hear that we have some appreciation for second-hand things that have been finely crafted, the things that will last, and things that are given a new lease and essentially repaired and reconstructed. It's, it's really good that these things are happening. <laughs> I was just going to add, I suppose, on the, I suppose the trade-off for, you know, you can spend hours trawling through an op shop with something in mind and just not find it. So if you're not going in, kind of just hoping to be struck with inspiration and find something that you love, as Kate, as Kate said, the trade-off is you get wine and you get to spend a couple of hours with someone like your hub or you get to spend um, your time in a, in a really lovely social situation with a business like the clothing exchange or you get to work with Glenn in, in gay, really engaging in the creation of this piece that you'll have for a much longer time and obviously in each case you're investing a certain amount of time and energy into this experience anyway. Um, how much of an impact or how much of that planning has gone into each of the businesses that we've outlined? Has that been a primary focus creating that um, service element to it? Initially no. Um, but I've realised that what I'm doing is as much about um, 
the service and the communication as it is the finished product. And it's, it's about actually developing a language and a story for people to appreciate um, what's going on. And it's, it, it's going outside um, creating items. It, it's more about creating um, experiences that converge on the wanky. I, can, I appreciate that, but you know, let's let's face it. I'm not making basics. I'm not making everyday things. If you are indulging in something in line, it's probably going to be an investment piece, and that's predicated by the type of design it is, and also the the dollar value that is put into that. Um, so when you are when I'm being aware of that, then I do obviously have to offer that kind of service. But because I'm looking at offshore um, retailers, on that level, it's really, really important that that service side goes to my retailers and actually that, that level of understanding and that level of offering um, that service and that repeat service is extremely important. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just a product like I can do everything else. There's no point of difference. It's not worth, not worth doing it. That's something that comes up a lot in discussion, I suppose, about the, the slow fashion movement that Karen outlined in some detail this morning, um, and why each of these business models are of particular interest to me is that I find that for each of you, um, you're encouraging consumers to really engage with what they're wearing in a different way, rather than spending, you know, two dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, a hundred dollars, whatever, on something that they they really don't get a, as much value out of because it's perhaps because they've just spent five minutes walking into a shop and they know they've tried it on, yep, good, we're done. Um, each of these business models, you really, you know, spend a lot of time with the clothes and get to know them a lot before you even make the transaction of a button or dollars or whatever it is. Um, how, how does that change, do you think, the way, the, the length of time people keep things in their wardrobe? Um, not just because of the price they've paid for them, because in some cases you're not paying anything, you're just paying dollars. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if that might be something that can... Yeah, and, and also perhaps, um, as Talia touched on this morning, how people wash and care for their, their items as well. Yeah, well I guess when, um, if you're an individual who's trying to consider your fashion footprint, um, I always think there's sort of a bit of a, a hierarchy of things that you can look to. Obviously, I, I, I prioritise buying second-hand or borrowing or sharing or reusing something that's already there, and that would include reconstructing and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then, I guess, working the way down, um, choosing, looking to support um, or to find yourself some sustainable textiles or something like that is a, a good next step. But also looking, um, I guess, being a responsible consumer and looking beyond what the product is and looking at what the business is trying to do and seeing whether this business is trying to be carbon neutral and um, supporting other initiatives and really trying to have a flow on effect. So you're not just buying one garment and supporting them um, for that singular purchase, you're actually supporting them as a business. Um, I guess you then have all the um, looking at the ethics of production and um, and that kind of thing, and then whether or not um, you're interested in fashion miles, whether you're looking at something that is flown in from far away or something that's handcrafted within, what did you say, nine kilometres of where it started? Twelve. Twelve kilometres, so that's um, all that. <laughs> Handy. Handy.